name is Brian Hopkins. I'm a principal analyst at Forrester. And um, I really like kind of small, intimate sessions here uh, because we're going to, the idea, and this isn't going to take an hour, the idea is to give you guys some brief ideas that nobody else in how many, like 17,000 people here are going to get. So we're going to give you a few ideas around this idea of a data marketplace that you're going to be able to go and hope, first off, uh, explore on your own, maybe through through some of your interactions with Tableau and Pitney Bowes. Um, but just take an idea away, and that's the really cool thing about talking to a small group. So let's go ahead and get started here um, with some of the materials. Uh, so I want to start this speech kind of putting you in a meditative moment. I want you to just think about a couple of trends, and these are things that if you had you probably already know these things, but I'm going to point them out to you, and I'm going to try to put them together and kind of tell you what I think it means. So the first thing I want to tell to you about is this, right? And we saw this happening in about 2010, uh, when all of a sudden we all had, like, we all started buying these, and then we got high broadband uh, um, access, and we had apps, and you know all the information we wanted right here in our hands. And so what that did is prior to that time, businesses, institutions, companies that could market and had the money, they had all the power. So they determined what we as consumers saw, bought, wanted. So this changed everything. Because this is what happened in about 2010, we entered something we call the age of the customer. And so if you read Forrester Research, we talk a lot about it. And essentially what happened is, is starting in about 2008, 2009, 2010, consumers, we started using these phones to get the information we wanted, to buy new things, and increasingly we would if a company couldn't give us the services and the information we wanted, we'd go elsewhere. Well, somewhere around 2010 to 2012, partially because Forrester pointed it out to, to enterprises, businesses, is everyone started chasing customers and realizing that customers now had the power. And so since that time, we've been in this, in, in this cycle where businesses have been trying to improve their customer experience. Most of you have kind of heard that. Trying to really compete to win, serve, and retain customers. So this trend had an an interesting impact on those of us in the room. It made the data about customers really, really important. See, before everyone had an iPhone, it was really hard to tell what a customer thought. You had to go up, stick a microphone, say, hey, what do you think, and then interpret that. But now that we had mobile phones and we had these systems of engagement built on those, now we could understand what customers, where they were going, what they wanted, what their behavior was. This social thing came along, and now we kind of knew what customers were thinking. And so that led to the rise of a term that I've covered for many years that most of you are tired of hearing, big data. Made big data really important, though. It made that customer big data extremely important. Now, starting along in about two, and I started covering big data since I joined Forrester in 2011. Um, since that time, I started looking at what companies were doing with data and how they were turning it into value. And what I started to notice is there was a kind of customer that was taking a very different approach to data and to big data analytics. And I didn't want to call these firms a data-driven company because the term had been used and I saw that it wasn't working very well for most companies, this idea of data everywhere, data, data, data. So we did a study where we identified what these firms who were succeeding were doing. And the thing that they seemed to understand better than everybody else was how to connect the loop between data, insight from the data, and action and that action was increasingly taking place here so I could instrument these and figure out what customers were doing in closed loops. And we call these a system of insight, right? And so what I noticed in about 2014 that there was a class of companies that were building these closed loop systems of insight. And they were really doing something that we named being insight driven. And there's five or six characteristics of insight driven firms. Systems of insight is one of them. And so as we begin to study these insight-driven firms, these firms that were really getting value out of all this big data, and we began to be able to identify who they were, we could look on places like Morningstar at how, if they were public, how they were growing, where they were growing at. We identified 40 public companies, and we used a, a, a database called PitchBook, which tracks uh, startups, to look at how a bunch of insight-driven startups were behaving and how they were doing. And what we noticed is that these companies that we thought kind of got this idea were growing at about 30%, 33% if you average public and, and startups annually, right? How many people in this room are working for a company that's growing 30% annually? One, two, 
Wouldn't we all like to work for companies that are going to, I certainly would. My bonus would be really good, right? So these companies were doing something with different, with data analytics that we call insight driven. And it was about not only having access to data, but understanding and being able to track data as it changed and being able to take action on those data changes in these closed loop systems they were able to optimize customer experiences with, right? So follow me so far. We've gone from this shift to the age of the customer into this area where, oops, that's mine. Into this, into this area where these firms called insight-driven businesses have really mastered how to take all this data and turn it into action. And they're growing faster than almost everybody else. So the third thing that's going on as you begin to really delve into this is everyone's heard of Moore's Law, right? Everyone's heard of Moore's Law. Um, I think the next 50 years will not be governed by Moore's Law. It'll be governed by something called Metcalf's Law. Have you, ever, have you heard of Metcalf's Law? Metcalf, you've heard of, you heard me say it, right? Who else has heard of Metcalf's Law? So Moore's Law, everyone's heard of Moore's Law, right? Moore's Law means that the power of CPUs doubles on transistors every 18 months, and it's kind of reaching physics limits. Moore's Law is about the value of networks, and it was actually uh, a, a, developed by a guy named Kreider, who named it after Moore, or named it after Metcalf. And essentially what it says, it's a mathematical formula that says that approximately the value of a network, when the network gets really large, the number of members of the network gets really large, doubles for every new member of the network. Right? And so if you look at how all these digital disruptors are really disrupting, what they're doing is they're taking vast networks of customers, taking those and moving them into these new areas with these experiences they've built. So you could say it's about data and analytics and, all, and technology, but what it really is is about leveraging this ex exponential power of networks, right? So when you really think about these exponential trends, what they are doing is over a period of time, they're reducing the cost of understanding the world to zero. It doesn't cost a lot of money to store a terabyte today. Now it doesn't cost a lot of money to analyze a terabyte because I can just stick a credit card in and get big data analytics in any cloud vendor, right? It's reducing the cost of software innovation to zero. It's really cheap today to, to take a disruptive idea and build a company around it. And what that's doing is that's increasing the, our, the speed of business change. In fact, how many of you have seen this chart before from Inno Insight? It talks about the average time companies are spending on the S&P 500. It's a fairly famous chart. Well, essentially what's it's showing, for those of you who haven't seen it, is that in the 1970s, Companies were spending about, on the S&P 500, were spending about, uh, what, what is that, uh, 35 years? And it kind of goes up and down, right? What the projection is, if you, just, if you do a, a line analysis of this, is that here we are in 2018, by 2025, it's going to be somewhere in the 15-year range, right? All these exponential trends, like big data and understanding your customer, are being driven driving the cost of software innovation to zero, driving the cost of understanding your customers to zero. They're making some big changes. Now, that's kind of interesting, but what's more interesting is this. I, I, I was doing some research, I interviewed a bunch of people just like yourselves, and I asked, is the pace of business today due technology faster than it was five years ago? These are direct quotes from the survey I ran. Right? Now, what struck me is that if I'd asked the same question five years ago, I would have got the exact same answer. Exact same answer. Because what I want you to realize right now is we are, if you think about the, you know, the S-curve, we're in this part of the S-curve where we're experiencing year after year prolonged or sustained business acceleration. Things keep getting faster, driven by these exponential trends. Things keep getting faster. And so when you think about an accelerating system, I want to just point one thing out to you, right? When we think about what it takes to create competitive advantage, typical ideas or memes in the industry, things like the hype cycle or things like crossing the chasm, they tell us being a fast follower, being the early majority, it's okay. In fact, it's a good strategy. And I talk to clients every day whose strategy is, let's wait to see that technology, let's let the bleeders bleed and we'll sit back and when it's ready, we'll dive in, right? Now, I want you to think about this for a sec. How well, so that's essentially a drafting strategy. I'm gonna draft behind the leaders. Now, what happens when the leaders can accelerate faster than you can? 
that drafting strategy don't work anymore. So what I want to point out here is that we're at this time, because of this period of sustained, prolonged business acceleration, driven by exponential trends, where the drafting strategy no longer works because you can't catch the leaders because the leaders are constantly accelerating, driving the pace, right? And that's where we are today in 2018. So if that's the strategy, then what do you need to do, right? And I, I need to show you this. That's basically what I just told you, right? And that kind of brings me some long setup, but some interesting ideas to, to the core of what I want to talk to you about for the next 20 minutes or so. And that is how you guys in this room today, by attending this conference and listening to this, can take a few ideas away that will help your business sustain that pace. Right? And the way that we did it is that Pitney Bowes came to, came to Forrester. Uh, we do independent research. And they came to us, and they kind of saw some of this stuff. It was kind of out there floating around. And what we did is we ran a survey, an independent survey, where we asked, and I'll show you the details of the survey, about 800 customers, so it's a pretty large survey, some questions about these things that we're talking about. And we came up with some really interesting findings that I want to kind of talk to you about. So we're going to get a little dry here, we're going to give you some slides, we're going to give you some data points, and then I'm going to pull it all together for you at the end. But the first data point that we found in this study is this, right? Demand for third-party data, data is increasing. In fact, 92% of firms agree they need to increase the use of outside data driven by digital technologies. And digital is another word for this phenomenon I just talked about, this increased pace. Because we can do business at the pace of ones and zeros, that age of the customer, need to understand the customer to survive, need to go faster and faster, means that every company wants more data outside their four walls, right? So let's, let's dig into that a little bit closer and say, well, why is that the case? Let's think about that for just a minute, right? And as we, so when we think about that, and that's kind of where we started this research with Pitney Bowes. So we ran a survey, as you can see, it's a pretty big survey from what we ran. So insurance, financial services, telecom, and real estate across US, Canada, UK, and Australia, right? So a pretty big and fairly high level, a lot of CIOs, a lot of senior, senior IT folks. So the first thing we found, and I'll go through this quick, guys, I promise. I know you go crazy staring at these slides. The first thing we found, number one, is that customers overall in the survey were fairly confident of their data analytics investments because they've been making them for a very long time, right? How many of you have been part of firms right now who've been making, who've increased their data analytics investments now for more than five years? Right, large percentage of companies have been investing a long time in data analytics, right? But as opposed to that, hey, we're pretty good at this kind of set of answers and the questions, when we got to customer data, the numbers changed. So you can see when we ask about customer data, to what extent are the following challenges with using customer data? Improving the quality and accuracy, maintaining the quality and improving the ability to detect and track changes in that customer data. So the point is, is that firms are challenged with change-related data problems when it comes to customer data. It changes all the time, very quickly. We need to understand them in the age of the customer to survive, and we need to go outside the data that we have to figure that out, right? So not surprisingly, when we kind of looked in this and we asked customers, if your company could better track and understand changes of data, what impact would that, would, would that have on your ability to act on insight? And over two thirds of companies said it would significantly impact not their ability to acquire data, not their ability, but their ability to turn data into action. And remember what we talked about before, turning data into action through closed loop systems of insight is exactly what these 30% growth companies do better than most everybody else. Right? <clears throat> so, a couple of examples. We talked to this company here, it was a financial services company. They have underwriters. And those, it, did anybody see the fact they're changing the FICO credit score? Right? Do you know why they're changing the FICO credit score? They're changing the FICO credit score because the FICO credit score, which is a fairly static thing, it doesn't change that often really slants underwriters of financial services companies to extend credit to the very highest end. And the people with really good credit scores have about as much credit as they want, and that market is tapped out. 
So financial services firms are saying, look, there are a whole lot of other companies without great credit, or consumers without great credit scores that are still fairly good credit risks. It's a whole new market for us to go after. But to go after that market, what we need to know is we need to take into account what your bank account balance is. That's some fairly invasive information that they can use if you ask them to create this expanded FICO score to allow you to allow banks to extend credit to people that the old model doesn't let them extend credit as well to. There's a lot of these things going on, but it's an example of what I'm talking about. Um, here's another example from a telecommunications company we, uh, we, we talked to. And this was a data scientist at a telecommunications company. And what their vision was is this. <clears throat> Families uh, uh, living in a home periodically who have children send those children off to college, for example, or out of the home. And what happens, specifically when kids send their, when parents send their kids off to college, is their, their mobile data needs change. So what the telecommunications data scientists wanted to know is, what's the likelihood that I have a graduating teenager in this home that signifies the opportunity to offer an expanded data plan to give you some, some new services that are more appropriate for the college environment? But in order to do that, they had to create an internal graduation model based on the data that they had. And having more data sourced externally, this data science was like, absolutely. If I could get more data externally, I could build a better model to understand when these opportunities are available so I can build these systems of insight that exploit those opportunities to generate more business. Couple more data slides, guys. All right, we, we navigated that one. Now here's the really interesting part. So we, we got this idea, yeah, more customer data, it changes all the time. If I could understand that data, if I could understand when that data changes, I can exploit some opportunities that I can't exploit now. Now here was the really cool finding, and when the light bulb came on in our study is when we asked about where firms would be spending in the next three years, right? How do you expect your company spending on the following types of customer data activities to change over the next three years? And we were all surprised to see that the number one thing is purchasing data via online data marketplaces. So that is the number one area where firms are saying, hey, look, there's this thing called a data marketplace. I can go get some data from it. I need more data, so let me go get some data, and maybe that'll help me out. And that's where firms are increasing their spending. Now, the next thing we did once we kind of understood that is we looked at our survey data and we said, okay, are current online data marketplaces good enough? Are they meeting the need? And uh, so this is what we found, right? What challenges does your company face in acquiring second or third party customer data products or services, right? And number one is high cost of licensing reliable data sets. So here's what we found, guys. We found that the typical way that companies acquire data is to what data set do you have? How much does it cost? Here's the contract. It's got to go over to contracts. They got to approve it. Legal's got to sign it off. Da, 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 da. And then we deliver it. Guys, it's not a server. It's ones and zeros on the USB. Shouldn't take that long. So frustrating. And they were, data, these data sets were very expensive because data sets had not adopted the same model that we like today in the paper use cloud. It's these big contractual purchases. People didn't like that. Timeliness and reliability of open data sets. How many people have tried and played around with open data sets in like a Tableau? Up or down? Yeah, yeah, right. They're not all that great, right? And so that's what we found. Um, difficulty finding the right products in an open market, right? Here's the thing. This is what I tell people about data. People come to me and say, Brian, I want to be data driven. I want to, I want to use all the data that's available to me to make better decisions. And I say, okay, data is being generated faster than you can ever possibly use it. So you're losing the battle before you start. You can't catch it. So, and this, well, basically what this says is, is that people are just having a hard time using the typical search related paradigm to find those data sets that are gonna be the right data sets that'll enable you to achieve your business goals. So finding data sets was another issue. Contracting requirements, we talked about that. And lastly, immaturity of data marketplaces was on the radar, okay? So, so this example, right, um, and that is from a, uh, I've actually the same financial service executive before, t 
talk to us about the tenuous relationship they had with, with, with vendors when what happened is, is they would bring in a data set from an external vendor to their internal systems, try to mix and blend that data set, which had varying degrees of quality, with their own data, which is already a mess anyway. And so you, you, you create variable quality data, long contracting process, acquire it, pull it in, and blend it with your crap, right? And you can see it's, it's, it's kind of not a great strategy. Um, so what we found in really examining what we thought data marketplaces need to be, this, these are the things that we thought. Number one, they need to be able to monitor clients' usage of data sets as suggestive ways to suggest new data sets that also might be valuable based on the cloud model of understanding how other people were using those data sets. Now what do I mean by that? One of the things I'm seeing as I talk to, to vendors that build cloud capabilities specifically multi-tenant public cloud, is that they can look at how people are using their tool. And because they can look at how people are using their tool, they can take that data and provide suggestive insights that makes the tool more intuitive. Why can't we apply the same thing to data marketplaces? Look at what data you're using, how you're using that data, use that usage to provide suggestive other data sets and to help other customers. So that's number one. Number two, blending internal and external data, right? That's always a problem. And today, most of the data, most of the way that we use and have found folks use data sets is they bring that external data set in and use whatever tools to try to blend it and make it good, right? By adopting a marketplace online capability where you can bring your data in, a data marketplace could use the way that this data is blended with other data sets to accelerate through things like machine learning and AI. Yeah, I had to say it. Um, all right, had to say that. Um, can help you make smart data blending decisions, right? Track data changes to exploit narrow opportunities. So here's the thing, right? And we talked about this earlier. If you can understand very quickly when data changes, to understand when that student has gone off to college, you have a very narrow window to get an offer in front of that, cu that cu customer being able to understand data changes as they happen creates narrow windows of opportunity. And this whole big data thing that we've been doing is really about closing the gap between data and action. And the requirement to be competitive is getting closer and closer. <clears throat> Improve their confidence through quality markers. And this is an interesting one, right? Every data set, every external data set has issues with it, right? We know that none of them are perfect and they come from a whole lot of different places. So what data marketplaces need to do, or what we found in the study that they need to do, is they need to give you some degree of how good this data set is, how fresh it is, how accurate the data points are, so you, as people working with data, know how to use the data, right? And today they don't, right? And last thing, they need to give you flexible licensing model, paper use licensing model. They need to make the data affordable and really easy to get, which they don't today. So, Kind of the, uh, the key point I want you to take away from this part of the, the talk today is we need to do a better job in the market creating these data marketplaces that leverage some of the things that we can do as SaaS in the cloud, that leverage new flexible pricing models to give folks like you, to help you unlock the value in data. To, and why is this important? It's important because you guys are a key piece of the acceleration of your firm. We talked about that business acceleration. Let me tell you why I think, why I think they're a key piece, right? I'm gonna come back to this in a moment. I'm actually gonna skip forward here. Let me tell you why they're a key piece and then I'm gonna go backwards a little bit. They're a key piece because I think this whole artificial intelligence thing exposes what is fundamentally a human problem in helping businesses go faster. See, technology can change really quick. We can change really quickly in the cloud today, for example, right? But as we begin to slough off of businesses those repetitive tasks that we don't need humans to actually do, what's going to be left at the core of tomorrow's successful businesses are knowledge workers who can't be replaced, who need data, who are curious, who want to be able to accelerate their firm. Now, here's Here's a really interesting finding from a piece of research that I literally, literally I just found this morning and decided to drop it in. We do a lot of research at Forrester about what keeps employees happy. 
And what we found, we've been looking at this, a lot of data in the surveys we run for two years. And what we found is that what makes people happy is not great leadership, smart people, free pizza, ping pong tables. That's not what keeps people like you happy. What we found that keeps people happy, keeps empowered knowledge workers happy, is the ability to self-regulate your attention and stay focused on the work that matters most to you. So if you're working for a company that frees the roadblocks, gives you a clear directives on what they expect, and gives you the tools and the time and the culture to make progress on those things, you're very likely to be happy. Right? You're very likely to be happy. So now, if we think back to that, let me just do this, and we think of, back to what it's going to take for businesses to really keep the pace, what I'm here to say is it's not all about sexy, cloud-driven, Amazon Web Services kind of next generation digital disruptors. In fact, this is not in, in, in the speech, but I think digital disruption is a boogeyman you don't need to be worrying about. We have a lot of data that suggests that in today's market, big companies are getting bigger. It's not small companies unseating the big companies. It's big companies using their money and their technology to create competitive barriers and actually get bigger. So the pendulum has kind of swung between the FANG companies, which are now all those big companies, and those companies are getting bigger. So looking over your shoulder at that startup who's going to replace you is not something that's worth your time to do. So what I tell companies is today, you need to realize that what artificial intelligence, machine learning, automation technologies are going to allow you to do is empower that growing group of folks just like you at your company to really help you keep the pace of acceleration because it's fundamentally a business change issue, which is a human problem. And keeping employees productive with the data sets they need to answer the questions that need to be answered and make the smart decisions is the really, really crucial thing that these next generation data marketplaces are going to do. And that's what our research found. So what I'm going to do now for the remaining, I don't know, 10 minutes or so that we have here, I told you this wouldn't take an hour. For the remaining 10 minutes or so that we have here, I'm going to invite Pitney Bowes up because they have some ideas around this. In fact, the funny thing was is this research that we did together about a year and a half ago actually influenced their strategy and they've taken the ideas that we found and they built a data marketplace offering that they can make available through Tableau. So with that, I'd like to invite Pitney Bowes up to talk to you for a few minutes, and then I'll be here for questions, or they'll be here for questions, so we can continue the conversation, or I'll give you a few minutes of your day back. Make sense? All right, can you guys hear me? Yes. Perfect. Um, so hi, I'm, I'm Crystal Myers. Can't... I can't hear you. All right. All right, you guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Perfect. All right, I'm Crystal Myers. I work for a company called Ironside. We're actually a partner of Pitney Bowes. We're here at the, the booth and at the conference along with them. Um, and a couple of things I want to show you are some use cases um, around how to take data out of a data marketplace like their software and data marketplace and leverage it in your analytic solutions. Um, we're going to show you a couple of more generic use cases and situations that maybe leverage multiple different technologies as well as a few that are focused specifically on Tableau. So you can see how data that's offered in a marketplace like this can be brought in directly into Tableau and incorporated into your analytic process. All right, so show of hands for some different industries here. How many people are in insurance? Okay, uh, financial services, few. Um, real estate, retail, all right. So you guys are from all over the board. There's a few more up there and a few more in general that I didn't mention. But just like you can leverage data and analytics in all of those industries and every other industry to find value um, and to answer your business questions, there's also value, um, as, as Brian was just mentioning, in bringing in external data sources and incorporating additional elements such as geography, demographics, geodemographics, um, parcel information, points of interest, all of these different data sets into your analytic process. All right, 
So this is an insurance-based example. Um, this is a prototype of our insurance risk analysis and aggregation solution. So what we're looking at here um, is enterprise data, right? data that you already own today, things like your policyholder information, the premium valises, uh, sorry, premium values <laughs> associated with those policies, um, historical claim information, right? All of that data you already own today. And then overlaying weather data on top of that, that lets you look at what is the likelihood that this area with this number of policyholders and this total premium is going to be impacted by either an upcoming event or has been impacted by a historical event. So it helps you to mitigate risk by identifying locations where you have a large number of policyholders that maybe have a high potential claim amount. Another example, a little bit different, this is for the fitness industry, so a chain of, of fitness locations or gyms. Um, we looked at answering several different questions to help predict um, customer churn and retention. You know, how likely is this person to quit the gym? Um, we've all been there, right? <laughs> so what's going to make us not decide to quit the gym? Um, so some of the questions, how does proximity to the gym, how far are they driving to get here? How does that factor in? Um, what does the drive time look like? It, is uh, it variable? Is, if there's a lot of traffic, does it take a lot longer, right? Um, how many competitors are on that route? If I'm passing five other gyms on my way to yours, and there's a lot of traffic on that route, I may want to go to the gym. I may want to continue to be um, you know, active, but I might want to go somewhere that's a little bit closer to me. And what else? can we learn about that member? You know, maybe I just am tired of going to the gym and I just spending money and never going. So, um, whoops, didn't mean to skip it. Um, so through combining internal drivers, like the information about the member that you hold in your enterprise data stores with information like social media data or this geographic information, drive times, routing, we can derive the answers to these questions by creating a 360 degree view of the member and determining whether or not they're likely to churn. All right, um, third example, this is law enforcement. So uh, we worked with the city of Manchester, New Hampshire. Again, all of, all of the product or the use cases you're seeing here are efforts between Pitney Bowes and Ironside to partner to bring these solutions to our customers. Um, so this is a predictive analytics um, use case. Um, so we took geospatial information like uh, historical crime data, uh, weather information, uh, neighborhood boundaries, and incorporated that into um, known crime instances in order to predict where crime is most likely to occur. So what you're kind of seeing in the background here is a 500 by 500 grid of a map. Um, shows the city broken down into neighborhood boundaries and then kind of that heat map behind it is showing you know hot spots and it varies by time of day um, and throughout time so for every day all through different times of the day what is the likelihood of a crime or the or how much crime is likely to occur at those different locations. And the value this brings is for the police department, they can then leverage that information to plan their patrol routes and ensure that when you see an area that's likely to have high crime at a specific time, you ensure that you have coverage for that potential event um, that, that hopefully doesn't occur, but you, know, you have somebody there. Um, so that solution resulted um, upon implementation uh, in a 28% reduction in crime rates for the city of Manchester. Um, and I think that was within about a six month period after rolling that tool out. Um, so a few more here that I just want to show you because they are Tableau specific. So all of you here are Tableau users, you're like, okay, this is great, but how do I do this in Tableau? Um, so if you're interested in seeing an actual demo of connecting to this data and bring it into Tableau, we just finished up a hands-on workshop on that. Um, and we'd be happy to show you a private demo. Stop by booth 1015. Um, but these are some solutions that are pre-built. Um, so the first one, um, if you were here last year, um, not here, but at the conference last year out in Las Vegas, 2017, um, we demoed this product. This is a site selection model. So 
most commonly associated with retail, but really any industry that has physical locations that service customers, you could leverage something like this. What we're doing is we're looking at the performance of each location and the customers that they're servicing. So every time you go shopping, they ask for your email address or your zip code. They want to know who you are, right? So stores or locations, they, they know who their customers are, but they don't necessarily have the context about those customers to know, well, what's their purchasing power? What's their, their um, you know, consumer segment? And that's where the enrichment data comes in because what we're able to do is look at for every store, how are they performing? And then where are the customers for each store located? Where do they live? Based on where they live, we know some stuff about them. They fit into a certain geodemographic profile and we can see in the little heat map in the middle there how those different profiles impact store performance. So we would look at our high performing stores, we would look at which profiles are driving that performance, so now we know how different customers are likely to impact our overall business. When we're looking for a new site, we want to open a new store for example, where do we go? And one of the factors in that is, well, where are our target buyers? And then knowing how those profiles impact your overall profitability, you can select an area that has the right mix of, um, of that target consumer. Um, all of these examples, the, the, this one and the next two that I'm going to show you, are out on Tableau Public. Um, if you search for Ironside, it's my company name, you'll see that um, the dashboard's out there on our public site and you can interact with them. Some of them are also downloadable, so you can see how they were built. Um, I also wanted to mention that the software data marketplace from Pitney Bowes can be accessed from the Tableau public page um, on the resources tab. So when you go to resources and they have all the sample data sets, there is a link from there to the marketplace as well. So this example is um, insurance focused. So on the right side here, or yeah, your right, my left. Um, on the right side here, we have um, a quick visual representation of some of the main reasons for insurance claims. When we're talking about property and auto insurance, right? Wind and hail, um, fire, crime, and water damage due to either freezing pipes or flooding or, or whatever the reason may be. So we've got wind, hail, fire, weather, crime, and flood. And with crime, you can um, select the type of crime. So you can look at property crime, robbery, arson, um, violent crime, burglaries, right? And you can see this is San Francisco. So over on the other side, we have all of our policyholder locations or potential policyholder locations. So at, for any location, if we were to click on the map on the one side, the visuals on the right would adjust and show us the factors that are relevant to that particular location. So we know very quickly and at a glance, without. We still want to go through underwriting, of course, but this is just a very quick visual cue of what are the most significant risk factors to that location when it comes to claims and what should we really look at in more depth. All right, and then finally, the um, targeted consumer marketing. This is the, the demo that we went through in our hands-on workshop. So um, the attendees of that actually had the opportunity to rebuild this map, which was a lot of fun. But what we're looking at here is creating marketing offers um, targeted to individuals based on their geodemographic geo profile. Um, and we don't necessarily know who those customers are. So the, the context is that um, there's a mobile application people can choose to download. If they download that mobile application, they're providing permission to track location when the app is in use. Um, and through that, we can identify a latitude and longitude coordinate that is most likely that device's home location. So we now have um, you know, information about people who are interested in our products or are currently using our products and where those people reside. Taking that a step further, we can incorporate historical sales information to say, okay, if they've signed into the mobile app, then they're a current customer. Right? They're, they're probably buying something from us or they at least have a CRM account with us. They're using their loyalty account or whatever it is to sign in. So we can look at what they're purchasing over time and how they're buying and their behaviors. We can then take what we know about those people who are buying from us and look at people who fit the same demographic profile to say, how are they likely to behave? If a customer in profile five is on average making a purchase of $4,978, 
how can we market to consumers in segment five and say, you know what, we want you to be buying a little bit higher than that. Let's try to drive up that average sale. So we're going to give you an offer that says, if you make a purchase at 5,000 or more, we're gonna give you 15% off or you know, something along those lines. Um, so these are just a few examples of how this data can be applied to real world business problems um, and specifically used in Tableau. Um, I don't know how Q&A works with the, the headphones, so um, I guess if anybody has any questions, we're definitely available at the booth, but that's all we have for you. I